Hello, this is Rick Shue. I'm Jeremy Grolke. I'm Michael Malloy. And we are Left Crew Politics. We were Left Shoe Politics, but uh, why, we change, why, why did we change the name, guys? People why? kept spelling it S-H-O-E. Yeah. I think it was just envy because it was my last name and you guys were pissed about it. And people mm. thought we were in the in the Rick Shoe cult and that got like a little bit like uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> people kept calling me Rick online and that was just such a, <laughs> an insult. That I well, had. those are the people that know us personally, but whatever. So guys, if you're listening... We are now the Left Crew Politics, C-R-E-W, and uh, just want everybody to know that, not to be confused, if you're following us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, etc., all of it transition, you're still subscribed, and our new Twitter handle is at Left, Sh- at left Crew Politic, and obviously on Facebook, facebook.com slash Left Crew Politics. I, I can't believe you didn't switch it to something else like that like had like something shorter with an S. Although I did check in because I was thinking like should it be like LC politics and but that was like some some county school in like some small town I think it was in Georgia or whatever so that wouldn't have worked though but I thought like we should have come up with something better to shorten it no oh well that's great that's, that's good timing Malloy yeah we're gonna yeah. we're gonna Mr Malloy we're gonna we're gonna air our internal drama here on and our, on our cold o- that on our cold and opening we'll come right back in five four three two one hi it's Michael Malloy from Let Oh, damn it. I don't even know the name of our thing. We're right. left crew politics. Left crew. All right, uh, fine. All right, Jeremy. Jeremy, why do you confuse everybody when you sign your initials JT when you used to sign them JG? I don't know. Why did you confuse everybody by naming our podcast left shoe politics with an <laughs> EW instead of an OE? Because that's my last name. Yeah. Yeah. No. All right, guys. <laughs> we are now left crew politics. We're going to get on with our show with our special guest, Matthew Chapman. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Welcome to 28 of the Left Crew Politics Podcast. I'm the host for this episode, Rick Shu, and I'm joined today by one of my partners in crime and my co-host for this episode, Michael Malloy. Michael, how goes it? Good morning, Rick. Cool. All right. And today we are very proud to announce our special guest, breaking news reporter from Raw Story, Matthew Chapman. Matthew, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, look... Your political Twitter commentary is that of like legends. <laughs> so, but let's give our <laughs> listeners here that may not know you, if you don't mind, give us just a brief breakdown of your political professional life. All right. Well, you know, I didn't originally get trained as a political commentator. So I actually went to uh, engineering school and learned to be a, a video game designer. And I still am that, actually. I program slot machines at a company in Austin. Um, so I've been involved on Twitter, the online activism scene for a while now, just out of out of a passion for what's going on in the world. And I really got my start in professional politics because I was noticed by Peter Dow. So the um, you know former advisor to uh, John Kerry and Hillary Clinton, he was running uh, Blue Nation Review, which became Share Blue Media at the time. He was intrigued by what I had to offer. He reached out and asked if I could write for him. I said yes. Uh, you know, I started out by just doing a couple of pieces a week, and it gradually grew into a full-time thing. So because I still really enjoy working as a software engineer for games, I actually juggle both as full-time jobs at the same time. When do you sleep? <laughs> um, Most of the time I'm not working. <laughs> yeah, right. I was thinking the same thing too when I was seeing how much how many things you're churning out every single day. I was like, my, like my God, like even like yesterday's like six or seven. Like how how many are you doing a day? Uh, I've ne- um since moving to Raw Story, I've never done less than six a day, and sometimes I do as much as thirteen. Wow, you're busy man. Well, um, again, thanks for being here and thanks for the insight and your, of your background and everything. I, I think you're a fantastic writer and I'm just, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to this conversation and I want to launch the topics. We all spoke off mic about what we we're going to discuss. Obviously, we talked about the 2020 election, um, but there was a new poll out this morning, the Washington Post. Did you guys happen to see this about Trump's approval rating? I, I didn't happen to see it. Yeah, it is up to 47%, which is kind of remarkable that that's an achievement because I remember past presidents, if you're at 47%, it was not a good thing, but we've lowered the bar so much across the board and virtually everything in existence for this guy that, you know, 47% is something to be celebrated. But 
it is noteworthy because I don't want any good news for him leading into the next election. But there you have it. I mean, I know it's a year away, but and 51% of that is that he has approval on the economy, which is obviously where his strengths are at. Everything else is, is kind of in the toilet, so to speak. But here's the right. thing that, stri- that struck me the most. So, we we're, we're, you know, I, I want us to discuss the, the primary and our top candidates and everything. And I think this is a great way to just sort of launch that conversation. So as it stands right now, and again, I get this is just a snapshot in time, but it is, it is important. Biden still leads Trump the most, okay? 53 to 43. Harris, 48 to 46. Warren, dead even, 48, 48. Sanders, 49, 48. Mayor Pete, 47, 47. Okay, Matthew. So you're our guest. So we're going to have you start this conversation off here, sir. What 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 are your initial thoughts of that snapshot in terms of uh, what it means for the Democrat Democratic primary and obviously leading into 2020? I would say that the the key takeaway here is that you know for all of his missteps in, over the past several weeks, and there definitely have been a lot of them. No one can deny that Biden still commands the nostalgia factor of from a lot of voters i think and i think that you know the sort of heavily engaged people that you find online are already quite tired of him but i think out in the in this the broader sphere of the democratic electorate there is still a lot of desire to you know go back to the obama era if you will and i think there's a lot of voters who believe that that for biden that's that's what he represents I would. Do you think that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I I wouldn't be quite so confident that that he'd really be a return to Obama. I don't really. I mean, for the for the record, he hasn't really stated much about what he would do to go back to the Obama era, other than you know protecting and expanding the Affordable Care Act, which is which is not nothing. Sure. Yeah, and he's talked about climate change some, he has. not to the extent that, that a little bit here and there, but not 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 to the extent that someone like Elizabeth Warren has or, or Jay Inslee. Or, 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 yeah, precisely, or Beto to give him credit. Yes. But uh, it's it, it is an interesting tactic here. And Michael, f- feel free to jump in. I I'm not real sure about Biden if if the nostalgia thing is something that will carry over because. We all want to move forward, right? We're, we want to get away from Trump. So how how do, how do we perceive that? Are we going back before Trump or are we moving forward past Trump? And I think that's going to be the tricky thing for him to balance as he moves forward. I, I, I think that uh, if I was taking like really think of my heart of hearts, what are Democrats feeling? What, what am I feeling? I, I think it, I agree that it is partly the nostalgia factor, but um, also we've been thinking about Biden for a long time. You know, there weren't any other candidates that we were really considering. We, I guess we kind of knew that Bernie was probably going to run again, but I had it. I, I was maybe starting to see Biden as the nominee and the guy that we were going to put out there. And it's just desperate for anything as we've been waiting for this primary season to begin. And maybe that's something that contributing to this, why he's still kind of there in people's minds. I am starting to feel like he is not going to be the nominee once it's all said and done. As much as I love Joe, I think the nostalgia factor is going to wear off because it's go- just just naturally going to heat up to be like a you know a pretty a pretty intense like primary process. Sure, it absolutely obviously- could. And you know, for the record, my I don't really. I mean, I I obviously have my own opinions personally. I I would love Harris to win. She's my first choice. Uh, Harris Warren sure. will be a, Warren will be a close second. Um, I think though that whoever wins, I just hope that they have the have the strength to unify the party and that the primary just doesn't get too nasty. Yes, I I do as well, and I'm I'm also really kind of over how many people are in this damn thing at this juncture. It's a little silly. But hopefully we start weeding people out and we can start focusing on on people that really honestly have a, have a shot. Now, listen, I don't want to rule anyone out because it's politics and things can change in one debate. You can have one soundbite and the trajectory is forever changed. I get all that. But there's there's a certain point where you're looking around going, all due respect, you know, 80 percent of you guys on that stage, you're not going to be president. Let's just can we I just want to whittle this thing down a little bit so we can focus on. And I don't want to. It's a turn in. 
like you know how forever like we said like the reason why so many people ran for president including Donald Trump on the Republican side is because there is a lot of money to be made there right there's just there's there's a you there's a future a financial future for you um by saying a bunch of outlandish things and utilizing like the primary stage and I, I am a little I don't know we'll say suspect but I am concerned that are there some of those Democrats who know absolutely that they won't win and are using just the, that stage just a way to propel themselves forward into national politics on cable news, whatever, you know? I think that's a genuine concern because they cannot be thinking they're, that they're going to well. Eric Swalwell, you know, like, I like him. I've seen him a lot on television, though, but there's no way he he's not going to this thing he was going to win. He's yeah, terrible, that was terrible in debates. Yeah. And it's, it's exactly, amazing. exactly. I, yeah, he's, he's good in interviews, right? But, man, he is, he is very weak on a debate stage. I mean, you and know, the, I, the, the, basic, the, the basic – thing that i have i i have heard uh from a lot from a lot of people who are knowledgeable about this is that swalwell mainly entered because he wanted to you he wanted to use the platform as a way of centering gun control more fully in the on the national stage yes and i wonder how that's working out for him in terms of is is that is that narrative like it, it, who else is talking about guns gun violence by the way is there is there a candidate that i'm just missing that that's not something that's front and center other than him is there anybody that's a good else question that's- i mean i think there 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 have definitely been candidates who brought it up there's no there's nobody who's really centered it and you know right. i'm honestly at this point after the debate i'm starting to question whether swalwell's presence is even doing much to center it right exactly well, it's, well, I think it's the, the entire setup as an absurdity. Not only, obviously, that many people that are up on the stage, but what's he, what's, what's the point here that you're like, um, so I know how I got to get myself, how do I get my name in there? I'm way all the way down on the end. And it's like, I, who can interrupt someone like and be strongest and be able to keep talking like long enough? And then I can make a good enough point, you know, and then that's how I'm going to get my issue like front and center. I just I have to think this is not the right way to approach, you know, like vetting ideas and issues and candidates like in, in the modern age. There's, there's got to be something better because that and also he, obviously he went into this thing with this entire higher approach of um i need to keep attacking biden yeah you you know i need to keep attacking and all, and also bernie with the idea that uh we we need the next generation we got to like turn the page he went with just basic talking points like i just he didn't do himself any favors i don't think he did his you know the cause any favors either in that format well let's let's shift gears here just a little bit because um staying on the topic but i want to really hone in on something specifically um matthew you had a tweet out a while back and you listed your top five favorite candidates um who were they tell the audience please sir and then and then kind of you know get us up to speed and let us know if it still stands right <laughs> right so my cur- so at the time i wrote uh, that my top five were in order: uh, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Beto O'Rourke, Julian Castro, and Cory Booker. And I would say that the list has actually not changed that much since then. Um, most of the movement, insofar as there's been movement on my list, because I because I ranked everybody, uh, is mm-hmm. more is more the bottom candidates. I've i there's some that I that I lost a lot of respect for, some that I gained a bit of respect for. Um, the, I might today switch around Castro and O'Rourke. Okay. Cause, cause, I mean, I still like both of them a lot, but I think, I think Castro really did a much better job at the debate of justifying why he, why he should be a top tier candidate. He absolutely did. To me, it was a, a shining moment for him and it made me remember, quite honestly, how much I, I like him. And it wasn't something on a conscious level I was trying to push him out of my mind. It just, he just seemed kind of inconsequential in this thing for some reason. And it was just on, I don't even know why. I can't even explain it. And then I think it's just because the media didn't give him the coverage he deserved. Yeah, and, yeah, it's exposure. That's and, all it is. And I hate the fact that I was a victim to that. You know, usually I pride myself in being able to see around that kind of stuff. But the media got me on that one. And uh, fortunately, he, he, he really did great. And quite frankly, he's moved up in my, he wasn't even in my top five and he is now. I think he's fantastic. Now, listen, I, I would like to talk about Beto, just so all, also the audience knows. All three of us on the show today live in Texas. Um, Jeremy, the other um, one third of the Left Crew politics, actually lives in L.A., but he has Texas roots as well. So mm-hmm. some of the some of this stuff that's Texas centric is really fascinating to me, and it also explains why 
I liked Beto so much, why why I was so excited for him to run, and why and I still have him in my top five, but he is slipping. But when you see firsthand what he did in Texas, it was a remarkable achievement. And to have deep red counties flip uh, blue and down ballot tickets and 500,000 Republicans, registered Republicans in Texas voting for him and independents coming out like we have never seen, it was an, it was an inspiring movement. And I really thought, man, if he could take that to the national level, even to a certain extent, and that he would probably have the best shot at flipping Texas because that 200,000 vote a swing that cost him the um, the election against Ted Cruz, that could easily be made up by demographic shifts in just two years. And by virtue of it being a presidential election, just a lot more people are going to still come out and vote. Absolutely. However, it's been, yeah, it's been a little rocky for him and he didn't do himself any favors in that last debate. And as much as I still love the guy, he, he doesn't have a lot of room left for mistakes. He's got to change something. So speaking specifically about him, Matthew, what, why is he still on your list, and what do you think he needs to do to to get out of this rut he's in? Or even why you explain why is he well, dropped? What do you what do you think is the reason why that he has not gained very much traction? Also, well, those are all very good questions. So, I mean, he does resonate with me because I happen to actually live in one of the counties that flipped to him. Uh, I live in Hayes County, which is just south of Travis County, and it's. It's where a lot of suburban Austinites have been moving out to lately. It's for the longest time been sort of a pinkish red county. Uh, it did go for Trump by a small margin, but it went, but it went very heavily Democratic in the, in, in the midterms. And, you know, not just for Beto, but down ballot, a lot of people got, a lot of Republicans got thrown out. We, we got a, we got a Democratic state legislator for the first time in a while. And I really do believe that we owe a lot of that to Beto's charisma, to the to his passion, and to the fact that he went out and connected with so many people. I actually went out to see him when he visited Seguin, mm-hmm. and I was just struck by the um, by the way that he made every question that was asked to him personal. That he tied it back to a story of somebody that he met. And, you know, you could, and, and, and that's why he caught fire, I believe, because he did his best to be a relatable politician, to be a politician who works for people. And I think that in the debate, to, to your, to your question about why he didn't really break out that much, is you could, re- you could definitely tell that he was trying to, to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Especially with, especially with his answer about healthcare. But, you know, it just didn't seem, it didn't seem to have the same amount of – it didn't feel as organic in the debate. Yeah, in the, in yeah, I debate. agreed. It did feel a lot more a lot more prepared. Did you see even afterwards uh, when Chris Matthews was interviewing him and he was asking, is that just kind of how you speak and how you answer questions that you um, you always kind of go off with a soliloquy like off into something else? And he and he's like um, – wait, I guess the, the basic foundation of his question was like, where, where does that come from? And he, and he replies – you know, I traveled around all over Texas and speaking to people. <laughs> Even like the way he answered that question, he goes way back. I'm like, okay, stop it. I guess just the answer, give I guess, me the straight answer. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, right, exactly. That's exactly the problem, right? Yeah. Here, you're do- Beto, you're doing it. Self aware, self aware. Uh, but I still like the guy, and if if he can somehow catch fire, I think he'll take off like a rocket. But I just don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if there's. A place for him at this juncture. I agree. We will. He's still in my top five. I'm still hanging. I want him to hang in there, but uh, something's got to change. Okay. I think uh, the difference. Well, let me let me try this, and I'll just put this out there. I really like Beto also, but I what we have been saying, and my my observation based on no science at all is that is you know maybe Beto is not quite as popular when he's not when he's not juxtaposed next to like the creepiest politician like ever which is Ted Cruz you know what i mean I, like that was like it is really easy to look at Beto and like oh my god he is amazing when he's next to that weirdo well, so it, well yeah but i don't want to underestimate um, I'm, I'm, I'm what, not trying, what he accomplished, I, though. He, I'm, I'm not. I'm not either. And it's not like that. I'm not a fan of his, but that has to be like a factor. And like maybe that's why that he needs to maybe find his voice a little bit better on a more broader scale when he's not up against somebody like that. I think well, that's listen, the reason he caught fire nationally. That's certainly true. I'm not sure. 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 I don't think that's the sole reason he caught fire in Texas specifically. Oh, that's a really good point. I like the way you phrase that. I 100 percent agree with that. 
That's not it, well. He also ran as a as a liberal in Texas, which you know most Democrats still seem like they're afraid to be liberals. And then he he you know pretty unabashedly ran as a liberal, and our, I think our message works. And I think that was another huge factor in like why he ran. And also at this point too, why you know I think like a lot of them on stage are almost afraid to be liberals and like in 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 many different respects. So well, uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I feel like that they're sort of embracing now they're running from the word socialism at least most of them are yes uh, so there's that but oh that's an interesting perspective but okay so going back to your list it's it's you know some people moved around Beto's still there he's still on mine as well um and you were saying kamala harris right now is your top choice mm-hmm. yeah she is <laughs> that, that's correct yeah cool i think she's outstanding as well she's she's right up there for me michael's not a big fan I know it's like I'm the negative one all from the peanut guy. Well, let me tell you what I think about Kamala. All right. So first, uh, Matthew, what – so I guess why do you like Kamala? Rick, you like her also though. What do you think are her, you know, positive attributes? Um, How would you end up at, at that place? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, I'm, ju- I'm just – floored by her stellar resume she's she's managed a broad portfolio of offices both local and statewide and i really and i really respect the work that she's done and second i think that she's an incredibly powerful fighter i think that she takes what she was able to do in the courtroom and she brings that to the political stage i think that Mm -hmm. she would absolutely demolish trump in a debate i think that he would be terrified to debate her i couldn't agree more when I see her, I mean, when I see her in action, whether she's on the debate stage or wherever she may be, she's always impressive. And and when I think about the two of them on a debate, I don't think he would know what to do with her. I really don't. Um, well, I mean, well, I I I appreciate it, and um, and even like I I think she could definitely she could very confidently she speaks very well. She I think she communicates her message very well up on the stage. But uh, there's something, uh, I don't know, something she doesn't come off as all that, like, genuine to me. And also, I kind of feel like that attack on Biden was a a little bit of a low blow and kind of bullshit. I mean, I I recognize we're looking at a primary and this is kind of like the nature of it. But I even thought, like, really, is this where we're going to go? Is the... Is the number two, the vice president to the first black president, we're going to go, you know, we're going to attack him as maybe he's got some, uh, you know, closeted racism. I thought that was like a little bit low for me. Well, but it it didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, he did. I mean, yeah, I I mean, as as a political point, as something like that, the country cares about what a colossal waste of time, you know, like I I just. Well, I don't I don't know if that's true or not, if they don't care about it, because she I I don't think they care. She she jumped up in the polls because of that debate. So just keep that. Right. I'm, no, I, I'm not. It I'm remains not to be seen the whether it's of, yeah. of a primary. Go ahead. You, you were saying it remains to be seen. What, Matthew? I mean, it's, it remains to be seen how much this issue will genuinely impact people. But there's no denying that it was a breakout moment for her, and that it made people pay attention. I yeah, think we'll that, see if it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the yeah, we'll question. See. The question is, how much was that due to passion for the specific issue, and how much was it? You know, them just seeing her on screen and thinking, wow, that woman will take apart Trump. One of yeah, the- I, th- I think it is that, that when you, you can catch traction and then you're like, it's maybe the first time anyone had ever even like heard from her, right? And so yes. they're like, wow, that's actually a very impressive person that I haven't seen before. Maybe that'll be my candidate now as I'm kind of like shuffling around. My other, th- my other issue with her was during the Kavanaugh hearings when she was um, going after him on that strong line of attack that – Frankly, that we were all getting excited about, you know, suggesting that he was perjuring himself. I mean, granted, he was um, in many different respects, but not on the thing that she was attacking him for, which are conversations that he was supposedly having with people from that particular law firm. And then when it panned out, not she didn't have anything to back it up. I almost thought that she devalued the resistance against him in, in that hearing. And it just looked like it was a grandstanding moment, like with nothing like left behind it. And that was probably the time where I kind of ju- jumped off board. I'm like, I am not down with that. I mean, I understand that politics is a little bit of theater, but it really turned me off because I think think it like it it's it scared some people away from the resistance against Kavanaugh. What do you think about that? Hmm. Mm. Sure. You've That's... talked about this before to me on a just, you know, I'll be honest, I didn't even notice that during the during the during the hearings. 
Yeah, I don't I don't know if I feel you on that. I just I, I guess I just wasn't following that closely enough. And hey, look, I'll look into it because it's 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 something that sounds like it could be. But I mean, you, do you remember? You remember? You know what I'm talking about, right? When when she was going on the line of attack on him and asking him like. You know, this is very important. Did you talk to so and so from so and so law firm and going down the line? And we, it sounded like that maybe that he was perjuring himself and it was a big gotcha moment, but there was no gotcha. It, it was carrying the news for a while. I think it maybe if, if you don't remember it, you, you'll see the video like and go back and look at it. Hmm. Okay. So maybe, all right. I mean, I, that's it's, it's a little side from the point, but that's kind of like when I jumped off board. Well, it could it could have been a swing and a miss. Uh, I'll, I'll look into that. I, I I still think she's fantastic. She's in my top as well, and she's one or two. I don't know. She's going back and forth. And the other person who's on top of my list is someone that I used to not like, that I took a lot of issue with, and I lumped Elizabeth Warren in with what I what I uh, see as sort of the Bernie. Tox, toxic isms from you know 2016 and I unfairly lumped her in with that and I look back and really watched the way she truly did embrace Sec- Secretary Clinton and really truly worked to try to help her get elected I I realized that I just I, I had her in a category that was unfair and part of the shift for me um, to not caring for her too much to now being someone that's on the top of my list is when I met her in Dallas and when I went to see her speak in person, and she connected with me. And then I, and Michael, you and I were obviously there together. We went over and talked to her and got our picture with her. And, and if you remember, we just, she she would have talked to us for an hour. She was just chatting away and she had a real connection with people. And I walked away going, that is someone that could be president of the United States. And I need to really re- reevaluate how I have perceived her. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm at with Elizabeth Warren. Matthew, what are your thoughts on her? Well, absolutely. I feel a very similar way. And, you know, one thing I should preface this with is that I actually lived in Massachusetts in the 2012 election. So I was one of the people who cast a vote to put her in the Senate in the first place. Oh, very Um, cool. So, yeah, my initial impression of Warren when we, you know, when the debate was first beginning was, you know, she has some great ideas. I'm not quite sure that she has the ability to work alongside people. But honestly, she's really been working her utmost to prove my doubts about her wrong. And that I really respect. She's just been doing, she's just been going everywhere, talking about everything, thinking through everything that she would do as president, not only just what she would do, how she would do it in a polarized environment. That is incredibly important to me. I want, I love somebody with a plan and you know, she, she just sold me on that. She did. She has a, she has an explanation for everything. It's like, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Oh, really? How? She's like, pull up a seat. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to pour you a cup of coffee and we're going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to explain it to you. And she has an answer for everything. And Michael, to give you credit, sir, you've been right about her all along. And when you told me I was wrong about her, you were also right then. So well, that's that's that's, that's Congratu- pretty congratulations. Yeah, yeah, so I, I know it usually works that way. <laughs> I, I find that when you um, she, I, I, and just to build on that, I, I, I agree. Like, I think that a big part of, I mean, it was, I was more of a messaging issue of why people, you know, people were having a hard time getting behind Hillary. She was, she was bad at getting the ideas out there and bad and bad about selling the story. I think Elizabeth Warren is way better at it, and the same way that, like, so. You know, there's so much that I like about Bernie, but one of the things, and, and Jeremy's brought this up many times also, uh, he doesn't, you know, I don't think he's very good once he's nailed down on the specifics. You know, like, how can you be preaching this gospel for all these years, and then when somebody really tries to pin you down, you don't know how exactly how things to pay for, or to be able to perfectly articulate the story. Elizabeth Warren can articulate that story. She is so smart. She knows all the numbers. She knows exactly what the message is, and that's why I've been, I've been really excited about her. As a matter of fact, that... Even this word socialist, as stupid as it is, is basically it's capitalism with uh, I'd say it's better capitalism, right? It's all yes. the benefits of capitalism with uh, a couple things built in there where the worst abuses of it where you can't have health care or can't have housing, things like that. And most of that is not ever perfect, you know, but it's definitely brought to a much higher level like it is in Europe. She doesn't call herself a socialist. 
because that word is too still too scary with all the people that grew up during the Cold War um, and certainly people that were born in the 60s. She's a capitalist. She's for better capitalism, and also, that is the way better message for our party. Also, I think the reason she doesn't call herself a socialist is because, quite frankly, I think that she is intelligent enough to understand the ways in which what she's pushing is different from socialism. I'm honestly not always sure that Bernie understands that that distinction. I 100% agree. That's a I, I could not have said that better myself. He doesn't understand it. She gets it. Anything that's Bernie, any any ideas he's had or things he has said that I've actually been impressed with because there are some things Elizabeth Warren Absolutely. says those same says those same things and she says them better and she backs them up better. So it's just Bernie that- is Bernie's not a policy wonk. I would say that like he doesn't seem that Matthew. What do you think? Does Bernie really know those numbers, or is he just kind of like he believes in the general philosophy of what he's selling? From what you've heard, yeah, he doesn't really he he, he doesn't really believe that stuff. I mean, like like the number the numbers very well. He's he's a believer in the cause. He's not so much a believer in the in getting to the nitty gritty of it, and it and it's worth noting that you know the you know right down to his signature Medicare for all bill that orig- that originated with John Conyers, right? <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a valuable point, but it but why doesn't he know number like why why doesn't he know he, perfectly is, is, how is, it's going to be paid? Is for? he still on your list, Michael? Is he still on your top five list? Uh, was he on my top five list before? I, I think so. I think that might have been just on my own natural name recognition where he was placed in the polls. Okay. I mean, like, it, it depends on, like, if you're asking me, do I think who's going to be the candidate? I would still say he has to be in the top five because you never know how this thing's going to turn. Sure. In my, in my preference, would he be the candidate? No. Would I like having him as president? Uh, yeah, I would still be very happy with Bernie as president. I would be very doubtful about now his his ability to win because he so much wraps himself around that that socialism word and his inability to articulate numbers. No, I agree. I have, right, I have about- Sanders at number 13 on my list. Do you really? Oh, well, wow. okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, that's probably where he's at for me as well, somewhere in there. He might be 10 or 11, but not not he doesn't fare much better. Matt- what about last time around, Matthew? Were you a were you a Sanders fan last time around or last time or around you've never I was been on board. Last time around I was all in from for Clinton from the beginning. I did not go into this. I didn't go into anything disliking Sanders. You know, when he first jumped in the race, my thought was, "Oh wow, we have we have two great people running." You know, I will admit that as the primary wore on, I got kind of tired of him. Uh, yeah. You know, okay. of, uh, yeah. or 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 more specifically, tired of the tactics that some of his supporters were using. Um, Russia, but. Uh, Russians. Not Russians. Russians. Not, not every, I'm not going to take there's, us there's, off. There's a real joke. Bernie bro problem, sir. Okay, and it's not from the Kremlin. I, I'm not, I, yeah, I know, but there's there's things. That well, that being said, well, that being said, well, that being said, there definitely were certain specific bur- pro Bernie accounts that did turn out to be affiliated with Russia. True. That I Absolutely. that I will was... that I will say. They they okay, they, so... they they went into everything to try to to try to influence and poison our politics. Well, I mean that's true. I mean that yeah. You, you think that uh, every, nobody feels that they can be a victim they even of use propaganda. Pokemon Go. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. I I read that also. But everyone, nobody thinks they can be a victim of propaganda. By the way, too, they're like, oh, I already knew that. I already knew that Hillary was that she was a communist and that she was a murderer. I don't need like no Russians to tell me that. Yeah, sure, right? You know, you're believing all these crazy <laughs> things, and then the same breath saying that like Russian propaganda that, like doesn't work on you. Um, but at the end of the day, it also worked on maybe us and a whole, definitely a whole lot of Bernie bros because the best political tactic as you can use is, is divide your opposition. And they did a really good job on that by convincing them that, you know, that Hillary was not aligned with the same type of beliefs that Bernie was back in the day. Exactly. And, you know, that's why I say that, you know, straight up, I'm going to vote for anybody who gets through that primary oh, even me too. even the even the people who are on the abject bottom of my list who I have some substantive problems with cuz yes, i cuz the there first there priority has to be removing trump number yes. one priority has to be removing trump and we see um our most largest base in terms of people that interact with us Matthew is our facebook page and uh, mm-hmm. we've got like 9000 followers on there and um so that 
we get a lot of activity on that page. So we see a lot of different, of different opinions, especially there. But what I see very consistently, and it's people on our page that are probably listening to the show right now, is a lot of no, not any blue will do. And especially when it comes to Bernie, it's always specifically him. And it's a, it's, it, it, it concerns me still a little bit because I still have, I still have a hangover from 2016 and I just don't know where this is going to go. Too. And if anyone thinks that Trump can't get reelected, they're not paying attention. He absolutely could. There was an analysis recently and I wish I had it in front of me to cite it. I, I just, it just came to me, but it was a breakdown um, that was, that suggested that Trump could actually lose the popular vote by 5 million versus just the three and still win. And that's a horrifying prospect. Um, yeah. Speaking, of, speaking it is. of Trump. I mean, I, I will say this. I, I will say this. I don't think he has much of a way to expand his map. But I think no. he absolutely but I think he absolutely has a path to keeping the path he had. And that's what we need to to work on preventing. A hundred percent now and I trust whoever the nominee is is certainly going to go to places like Pennsylvania and actually talk to people there, which Secretary yes. Clinton should have done. So we we know that that's in the bag. But we have to move some people and we have to get people out to vote. So there has to be there has to be a candidate that inspires as well. And that's, again, going back to Beto, one of the reasons that I liked him and still do. And I think to talk one more candidate real fast here, just for the sake of time, Mayor Pete. What do you guys think of Mayor Pete? Matthew, what do you think of Mayor Pete? I I came into this really liking him. He slipped down my list a little bit. And the main reason for that is his just his his inability to respond well to the to, to to the policing issue in South Bend that was not good it wasn't good at all and it it, nope. it makes me it makes me very much worry that he could articulate civil rights in an authentic way on the campaign trail 100% and i like him a lot and i i love him in the po- podcast and he is so sharp and i mean the guy speaks like more languages than I mean, I mean, is there a language that guy can't speak? I think I've heard him speak. Absolutely, like 10 he's, brilliant. At some point. he's brilliant. That, he's and that's, brilliant, and that's how guy. he he's won. A brilliant guy. That's how he won with so much support. I mean, you have you have to be creative, hundred percent, right, to to be taken seriously as a candidate from uh, running for president as mayor of a small city. So that that's quite an impressive feat. When I saw when I saw him speaking French on television, I was like, "Oh, thank God! The French know that at least one American <laughs> speaks French." You know that we're not all idiots. <laughs> well, it, I, I, I think about just you talk about someone that is just the antithesis of Trump too. I mean, everything about that man is, you know, he, he first of all he actually served, and I'm not suggesting that any sitting president must have military experience. But when you're someone that's a draft dodger, then you're you have faux patriotism, and you're hugging American flags, and you play that bullshit. Ugh. It's nauseating. Exactly. But and uh, just how articulate he is and how he thinks everything through. But to Matthew's larger point, you know the 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 the, the uh, political gods inter- intervened here and tested him, and uh, he he failed that first test, and that was a big test. And maybe well, I I mean I I from I understand where I'm 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 gonna approach this from a pragmatic side rather than like a political side because those aren't always the same because sometimes it give you just about how you feel. I mean his issue. Um, with whether or not he should, you know, fire the chief and, you know, certain issues like with, with race, uh, r- race relations between the police and his, and, uh, black citizens, uh, there in South Bend. I, I, I it's sometimes it's like, it's unfixable, like in the short term. Right. And at least, at least he took responsibility for it. And I felt that he, that, uh, that like how he communicated it seem like that's maybe the best that he could do. Like I'm saying that just not from just the political side, you know, with, but I'm really trying to take a full analysis of it. Like what else could he have done? And I know it's kind of like, well, you fire the chief. Well, sometimes like firing the chief isn't necessarily the best course of action. Even if people are like really upset and demand, like that think that heads should roll. So I, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, the, the, I, the thing I'll agree with you the most on that is that, um, is, is that he did handle messing up well. And that yeah. that is something that a leader must do. So there is that's a great that's a great point. There is, yes, there, 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 there is that. Okay, there's one last little quick topic I want to discuss here, guys. Is it's a really it's all tying into the election, of course. That's what we're talking about today. But the prospect of Trump getting reelected, which we've already discussed that, and we all know that it's there is a path for that to happen, and it very well might. And so we need to fight accordingly. Correct. Okay. 
why isn't anyone talking about Supreme Court justices? If, if Trump gets reelected, let's be realistic here. He's, he's appointed two so far, one of which was Obama's pick that he was cheated out of, but he has mm-hmm. two. And they're there. They're confirmed. He gets reelected. He'll have probably a minimum of two more and maybe even three. Mm-hmm. And, if, and if Mitch McConnell still holds the Senate, they're all going through, all of them. And imagine a, a Supreme Court with four to five justices that Donald Trump appoints. That is a horrifying thought. And I, I think that should be, it's paramount to getting the message of how, how important it is to remove this man. And maybe we'll get more of that as things move on and we have a nominee, but I'm not hearing it right now. Matthew, what do you think of that? Absolutely, you're absolutely right. If Trump gets another term, if he gets two more justice, if he even gets one more justice, then democracy's more moribund for fifty years. Yeah, I, 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 I can't. Maybe and that, that's I, that's not hyperbolic, by the way. That's no, no. That that that's it. I mean, can, even like what happened just with the uh, the most recent ruling on on gerrymandering. Like how how awful is that, and how bad is this going to affect us? You know, setting setting that precedent that that is not the role of the courts. So what? So what does that mean? What is the well, what is the final safety valve like in well, democracy the when it continues? Well, going forward, as a result of that ruling, we're going to need to move the battle to the states a lot, and that's another reason why this thing is so important because we the, the court has still for the time being, left open avenues for for popular action to fix this. But we all know that just four years ago, I, I, I would hope that we all know that we all know this, that four years ago, the court narrowly ruled that it is permissible for uh, for voters to directly set up an independent commission. And so a lot of states have done that. But right. Roberts was on the losing side of that. I think that if we get an, I think that if we if Trump gets another justice, those commissions are also going to get ruled unconstitutional. So well, those those commissions are going to go away regardless because now that the now that the court has said that they're not going to intervene, uh, you can't. Um, the Democrats aren't. You know, I think that they did that because this is the best thing that we should do, like moving forward. But now we're going to have to start stacking out more liberal areas to start pushing out conservatives. This is going to just be an arms race in 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 blue areas. How many how many representatives can we get stacked up against like the red areas? This is horrible for democracy. I thought like no way would the court rule that way because that has to be the one final thing. That is going to protect us from what's going on. And now I don't know how to get out of this. Mm. I just know I want to hear more yeah. about Supreme Court. I want to hear more about gun violence and right. not well, just the thing, to, the thing to go for. Well, one step at a time. Our first step needs to be removing Trump, securing the two seats that we have on that court of justices who could retire or pass away soon. And then if we manage to do all that, we need to hold on to the White House and then, and see if we can get Thomas's seat. Mm-hmm. If we can do in that best case scenario, we can get the court back in in with it within maybe a decade or so. Right. Let me let me throw this out there uh, since you since you meant it, since you mentioned Justice Thomas. So Clarence Thomas, uh, summer of twenty twenty, says that he's going to retire at the end of this legislative session. Uh, which is, I think, within the realm of possibility. What does that do to the election? Something like that happens. Well, that it'll force, that it'll, makes it'll, the it'll force the ten issue. times higher. Right, it'll force yeah. the issue. It means that I mean, it, it like, means that once again, just like the twenty sixteen election, control of the court is directly decided at the ballot box. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that most liberals. It, it, I'm, I'm saying people that are not that much into politics do not recognize how important appointing Supreme Court justices is. Like, that is, like, one of the top issues, and they've made it that way for Republicans for years and years because they know of the repercussions from it. Uh, they, the, we have to start focusing on that. We need to start focusing on, the like, the 10 past god-awful rulings that come out of the Supreme Court yeah. and directly connect it to that's what, that's why we are where we are. And we have and made so people progress. can understand that. We made mm-hmm. we made a little bit of progress with the uh, with the founding of groups like Demand Justice, but they're still yes. leaps and bounds smaller and more fledgling than any of the big uh, the big conservative groups like the Judicial Crisis Network, the Federalist Society. We need to build up this infrastructure if we have any chance of competing on in ter- in terms of of this space. 
What what are your feelings about court packing? Uh, if we win the the win the White House this next term, well, we would need to win the Senate as well. But you know, sure. I'm absolute. I am in favor of it. Actually, court packing has been used before many times. It was a common tactic in the 19th century. Um, one of my favorite examples is um, when when Andrew Johnson was in power, the Republicans depacked the court. They they removed three seats to ensure that he would never be able to appoint any other justices. And then when he, uh, and then when he uh, retired or from from office, they undid that. I didn't even know about that though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, the, the, so the, this is I not did, some the, sort of. I guess yeah. The number has decreased before. I just I did, wasn't paying attention to like what what yeah. what. So what when he that. was so when he was in so when Johnson came into office, there were ten justices on the court, and uh, the radical Republicans in Congress reduced it to seven because they were about to impeach him. They wanted to make sure he couldn't appoint any justices while they were impeaching him. And then when he left office, uh, by that point, only one. Justice had retired, so they were at nine. So they said, "Ah, screw it, we're going to fix it at nine. And that's where it's been <laughs> ever since. We Ain't that a thing. We look. It's right now. It's July of two thousand nineteen. The election is over a year away. Uh, when do we cast the first vote? Here, it's in Iowa, right? That'll we're still how many months away from that? I mean, the bottom line is it, it's early, and so obviously this whole conversation is a snapshot in time, right? But right. I, I, I would love to pick this back up with you if you would come back on the show down the road, a few months pass, and just kind of see where we're at and, and pick your brain again about um, about the, the current state of affairs, if you would be so kind to do that. Sure. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, Matthew, we're going to wrap this up. Um, I, again, appreciate it very much. And we'd love to, uh, to give you a platform here to just plug anything you want to plug. Where can people find you on Twitter? Whatever you want to say, sir. So uh, I, you can be, you can follow me on Twitter at Fawfulfan, and uh, just uh, you. Um, and if you want to see my lengthier work, feel free to go over to Raw Story. You'll find on on Mondays through Thursdays and Saturdays, I'll be writing a lot of the content there. Fantastic, and it's always great. Well, listen, we greatly appreciate it, and again, please come back and chat with us sometime down the road. You got it. In closing, thanks for listening, and please remember to hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and wherever great podcasts are found. I am Rick Shu, and on behalf of myself, Michael Malloy, and Jeremy T. Grokey, we thank you for your support. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of our Left Crew Politics podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Left Crew Politics. Follow the Facebook page at facebook.com slash leftcrewpolitics, and the LCP website, leftcrewpolitics.com. Search for our channel on YouTube, iTunes, and Google Play. Yeah, I was out there. Yeah, I was out there.